Jesus. Am I recording right now? Yes. He's like, get this thing underway, man. I haven't even got my podium up. Whatever, let's see if we can catch him saying something, right? <laughs> no. Plan on saying something very controversial today. See if you can catch it, okay? I don't know what it is yet, but we'll figure it out, okay? You know there's something every day. Just what nobody is. Ah, uh, you know, in today's culture, people are very sensitive, right? This might be the very thing that's the, you know, controversial thing to say people are sensitive. Is it okay to say, is it a bad thing to be sensitive? It depends on the level of sensitivity. How sensitive, right? Yeah, because remember we were talking about Aristotle and this idea of um, the golden mean between extreme or excess and deficiency. If you are you're not sensitive enough, I mean, you could be a sociopath, right? You don't care about... Come off as unempathetic. Not even come off, just be unempathetic. You go kill people and don't care, right? There's that. I mean, that's what sociopath, sociopath, you know, the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath is a sociopath is created, a psychopath is born that way, allegedly, they think. So, uh, you know, all the standard, you know, if you find, figure out who's, um, you know, like <clears throat> Ted Bundy, you know, the typical sociopaths or psychopaths. You know, these guys are serial killers, you know, but they're, they're sociopaths and psychopaths that walk amongst us that will never kill anybody, but they will wreak a lot of havoc on society. We gotta fix this thing, this thing wants to drive me crazy. Uh, yeah, so it's possible, you know, to be around. They say about one in a hundred, and when I say they, there's a particular group that says this, that um, uh, from England, I used to show my ethics class a video on psych psychopathy. They say about one in a hundred, maybe two in a hundred. In Britain, they seem to suggest there are more psychopaths in America than in Britain. I, I think that's just their nice accent speaking. Um, I think this is better. All right, anyway, and uh, they cause a lot of problems. Now, what does that do for ethics? You know, we're talking about Aristotle, the Nicomachean ethics. Well, you know, certainly you have no sense for the highest good because the highest good has to do with virtue. But unfortunately for the sociopath, we, uh, the tendency is for them to uh, view different, they, they tend to view people as instruments rather than as intrinsically value and valuable. And I suspect that what they do is they have a failure to, to understand what intrinsic value is. Um, and that is why they can't empathize with that which is destroyed people, that is. They can't empathize because they don't recognize their value. Um, I think recently um, several kids have been brought across the border and they're finding out the uh, molestation rate is pretty high, I'm not gonna give a percentage, but virtually all of them are being uh, sexually abused. Is sexual abuse okay? Well, no. But apparently some people believe it is. I don't think it's so much that they think it's okay, they just don't care what the- That's right. The, like, they don't they care. Do, they don't care what happens to them as long as they get what they want in that moment. You think they would pass a bill, you know, which many of them would. It's called NAMBLA, the uh, North American Man Boy Love Association. Would they pass a bill um, into I law believe. that lowers age of consent laws so that they could have sex with your son or daughter? I absolutely believe there are some people in power that would do that. Well, don't you think so? Yes. I think recently there was a judge who, um, who just got caught with 28 images of uh, boy, young boys being abused. Yeah, they were on his home computer, his work computer, and his phone. Oh, you know the guy? Mm. No, I don't know the guy. I saw the <laughs> uh, news headline though. Yeah, uh, it was. Now, tell me about this judge. Does he have any importance to anybody? Um, I mean, I'm sure he has family who cares. No, about no, him. politically. Oh, he was a political um, judge. He was, but he's but, I mean, not I mean, very high up. It's not like he has superpower, like. He's not on the Supreme Court, but, yes. what, but he did have, uh, there were certain cases that he had uh, decided, having uh, one of them specifically having to do with trans sexual book reading time in the 
libraries where there were people having problems with um, with what was it called? Um, they used to call them this, and uh, not just transsexuals. I mean, they, you know, they called them uh, drag queens. It's like drag queen story time, right? And so they were having problems. People are like, I don't want my kids. Uh, being read stories by drag queens for one. Two, I don't want the public taxpayer dollars going to indoctrinating my children into this lifestyle that it's okay. And this judge comes out and uh, says, no, no, it's okay. Okay, so he, this is the judge that kind of uh, made that statement. And so, uh, so he, you, you see, one of the things um, that is going on in our current society is that certain people are with certain worldviews uh, are finding themselves in positions of power as gatekeepers. What do I mean by that? Like book publishers would be gatekeepers, who, those who decide what books get published, what books do not get published, right? And if they don't like what you say, the, the person in, you know, the editor just goes, oh, sorry, we're just not looking for this manuscript type at this time go find somewhere else you know they don't tell you why they don't say well we're uh you know we're we're of this political or religious view and we don't like your political or religious view so we're not going to let you you know say it yeah because then that would be unethical it'd be um opening the door matters. it would be opening the door to um you know a court case you know and you don't want to tilt your hand as to why you don't want anything to you, you don't want your words to be used against you. You say things like, oh, sorry, we're just not looking for this type, or we've had this, you know, too many, or, you know, just not what we're looking for, or whatever. Very basic, plain line. Vague, as vague as you anyone. can be, yeah, don't give any information. So, so you'll find that bureaucrats, people who find themselves, bureaucrats are unelected officials that work in government or in the system, uh, and they find themselves in positions of power. Now they're unseen, but they hold wield a lot of power, okay? And they usually wield their power in the form of a gatekeeper, okay? So on this campus, like for example, if we had a club, you know, that wanted to get, you know, accepted a new club put out, and uh, let's say the person in charge of, you know, accepting requisitions uh, for clubs doesn't like the club for political reasons, she or he could say, Oh yeah, this we can't have this kind of club on this campus for whatever reason, okay? And they're the gatekeeper, and that's that's kind of one of the things that goes on in here. Now that's power. Would you agree? That's not philosophy. That power does not might does not make right. We ask the question of something right or wrong. You could have something that's uh, morally good, uh, but that doesn't mean it'll get through. Okay, so there are those who just believe. Political power is good. And then there are those who believe uh, good is independent of power. Okay? So you could, for example, the Christian message, the gospel, is very unlikely to be heard in a, on a college campus that's not a Christian university. Well, because those who pull the levers of power in both our government and at the schools uh, just aren't going to allow that to happen because they're gatekeepers and they often keep. Uh, Christians out of the conversation. They keep Christians off the committees. They keep Christians from being uh, hired at, at college campuses. It's very difficult for one, just in general, to get hired as a college professor. I, you know, it'd be easier for me to go back into acting and get gigs, right? Uh, but, you know, um, Let's pretend it's even harder because you're a Christian trying to work on a secular campus where uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of the professors there are uh, neither conservative nor Christian, okay? Conservative meaning they'd be congenial to the Christian worldview, Christian being very specific to that, okay? And so it's very, you know, so uh, worldview um, is very important for one, but, but power is another, the ability to express your worldview and there are those out there who have taken on, uh, you know, places of power as gatekeepers, news outlets, uh, hiring committees, etc. You, you read about this one? Um, when being hired to a uh, campus, do you have to disclose your religion? 
depend, uh, no, but this is how it works. I hand out a CV, which is called curriculum vita. On that curriculum vita, um, if you want to be hired, you must have published. Mm -hmm. And so they want to know what you've written about. So, you know, obviously. So you write about I wrote about, look, I've written about uh, same-sex marriage, and I did not write about it in the affirmative. I can guarantee I'm not going to be hired by a secular college. It's just not going to, the chance of that happening is so rare indeed. And if I were hired, my head, yeah, I mean, they'd be hunting my head right away. There'd be people in there, we've got to get rid of this guy. Yeah, they'd be looking for a reason to get you fired. They've already got a reason. Well, <laughs> they'd call me a homophobe, a transphobe. Reason, like, they'd call me a sexist, and they'd call me a racist and everything. I've been called everything under the sun uh, for, for being a Christian, okay? For, for being against same-sex marriage, okay? Um, question, but that's okay. I mean, you could call me whatever you want. Um, I think at the end of the day, if you call me Christian, that is, you know, and you don't like that, that's a good thing, okay? Because if loving God was a crime, then I'd be an outlaw, as the song says, okay? It's a great song. And that's what it comes down to, does loving God change how you act? And do you have pressure to act differently? And in today's society, you absolutely have pressure to act differently as a Christian. If you're a Christian and you act out your beliefs, you are certainly even more so, even more so than when I was your age. Because of social media, you put down, not just I'm a Christian, that's one thing, that's vague. I believe in the Christian ethic. What is the Christian ethic? When it comes to homosexuality, what does scripture say about it? What? You stole my joke? Ah, uh, well, that was Old Testament. Um, yeah, but uh, Jesus said, you know, he who is without sin casts the first stone. So we don't stone people to death anymore. Uh, we'll let God do the judging. But that does not mean sin is gone, okay? It doesn't mean that homosexuality is wrong, okay? Uh, doesn't mean that, but I mean, I mean, we talk about sexual immorality in general. I mean, I, I talk about homosexuality, and that's. But what about the heterosexual? Are there heterosexual sins? Absolutely, the watching of pornography. You know, that's certainly something uh, young men and even women nowadays will struggle with. It's both the treatment of other women as uh, even the men as. Uh, objects of pleasure rather than subjects worthy of, of love, of grace, and mercy, and, and the like. Uh, it, it turns people into objects, not subjects, like I said. Um, it, it destroys your, your ability to have intimacy with your own wife. It destroys the concept of what a family is, that a father and mother, or a mother, husband and wife, come together to become uh, uh, fathers and mothers to rear children and to do so in a healthy way. Um, like I said, so when you're, and then think of all the abuse of children that we just discussed. Uh, do you think that can be um, stimulated by pornography uh, viewing? That, that do you think that those uh, people who are hurting children also are, are uh, partakers in that industry? I bet they are. So I would say yes, but I don't think that their want to hurt children comes from porn. Like, I'm sure it doesn't help, especially with the vast amount of Let, Let's say there this. Are in it the existed world. prior to porn. It is not necessary to have porn to do it. Do I think However, they inflamed it? Yes. Do yeah. I think it is the cause of it? No. Right. So, I mean, it's in there. Now, it, it aids the fantasy. Does, how, many, how many marriages have been destroyed by porn? Lots, and I know several I personally. Say, I have no idea. No, oh, I, I know personally on an anecdotal, I can't give you a stat because I'm not a statistician and I don't trust them anyway because the stats don't lie, but liars use stats. But I do know anecdotally several marriages that have been destroyed over, over that stuff, okay? I know marriages that have gone from just being pretty decent to um, um, opening up their doors to other people into the bedroom, which has resulted, yes. And so, yeah, because that's what that stuff preaches. Well, anyway, point being, I, my point isn't that, you know, my sexual ethics from a Christian worldview is strictly anti, strictly anti-homosexual, which it is, but it is also 
has a strong moral component to our sexual act, you know, activity that it is geared towards the creation of a family and the, the bringing together of, of a husband and wife. Okay, it's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. What it's created for, the deviation from that is what destroys it. So, so but if people looked at my CD and they saw that I spoke out against this, they'd be really mad. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they are mad. I've had some very nice statements about me made. Um, but I mean, yeah, so you, you right now in your world, especially with this, what they call woke culture, are you woke, you know? That's, um, the answer from a Christian worldview should be no, I am not woke. I am a Christian, okay? That's the way it works, okay? And to be a Christian means you follow Christ. You don't follow the, the popular fad of blame everybody, right? It's follow Christ, take responsibility for that which I am res personally responsible for, which I can be responsible for, right? Forgive those who have sinned against me, off of the other cheek, right? Um, now, how is this philosophically? Well, these are all tr either true or false statements. If God doesn't exist, then what does it really matter? If you're a racist, if you're a Christian, if you're whatever, right? Who cares? I mean, I think you're not going to get judged, as a right? Person should care, like why? Even if there is no judgment on the other side, I feel like you should be a good enough should. person to care. Why do you should. say should? Why? Because not everybody's like that. Not but what does it mean? The what, what do you mean by the word should? That you ought to. Why ought you? Because it's what's good for people. What do you mean good by for good? Humanity. What do you mean by good? Why should we be good for uh, humanity? Because it makes the world a better place to live. Why do we care if it's a better place? I'm not saying you do. I'm just saying should. Why should we? That's what I'm saying. Uh, do is a descriptive term. Should is a prescriptive term. Because why should I care at all? This is ethics. This is you know the, the question for that. Why should I care at all? Because it's ethically good. Right. It's the correct thing to do. Correct. Correct is two plus two is four. Morals prescribe, tell you what you ought to do and what you ought not to do. Why? Why should I care? Because you said it's the, like... Because it's a good thing. Well, what do you yeah. mean by the word good? Without uh, being circular. I mean, it's not bad. Right. What's bad? The absence of good? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. I mean, think of, think of the atheist, and you go, you shouldn't cheat on your wife. Why? It'll hurt her feelings. And he goes, what do I care about her feelings? I mean, if he says that, she probably shouldn't be married to him in the first place. Doesn't matter, but why should he care? Because she's his wife. Why? Who cares? Why have a wife in the first place? I mean, I suggest against it, but... Why? You would, but are you a Christian? Yes. Uh, you paused on that. Um, look, the quite, we in America live in a post-Christian world, okay? Meaning Christianity is not necessarily the dominant culture on the globe, much less in America today, okay? Yet, there are vestiges of Christianity in America, namely in what is understood to be the traditional ethics, the idea that there is such thing as good and evil. Get rid of Christianity and tell me, and Judaism, right? And tell me what you mean by good and evil. Get rid of God, the devil, sin, law. Tell me, what do you mean by that? The concept of marriage has been around for a long time as a social construct. But get rid of it as a as a sacrament or a covenant with God, and what does it even matter? It's just a social contract. You have contracts with all sorts of people, and you break them all the time, right? In your best interest. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Why should you stay in any contract that's not in your self-interest? I mean, technically you shouldn't. But if you're self should it? Well, by just... should, what do you mean again? You got to remember. You, when, we're, now, in uh, lecture eight, which I just put a, up a quiz for, the word, sh uh, you know, we talk about stuff like univocality, using the same term the same way. Whenever you say should, what does that mean? Am I going to hell? 
No. This is just me. If I want to get my way, I ought to do this. It's called a hypothetical imperative. If I want to get buff, I should lift weights. Therefore, uh, I should lift weights because I want to be buff, right? It has to do with what I want, the desired outcome. Hypothetical imperative, if A, then B. If I want to get bigger, I should lift weights and eat more, okay? Um, but, that, but it doesn't say I have any imperative to get buff or bigger, right? Or more healthy. We're talking about a categorical imperative, one that says, no, you ought to do this. You ought to love your wife, even if she is not still a princess, whatever, the thing you married. Through thick and thin, you rich or poor, better or worse, sickness and in health, you ought to stay by her, no matter what. Ought I? Tell me I ought to. And you would do so more than likely based on the Christian ethic, okay? Jewish, okay? A religious ethic, this idea that God has cr created this thing called the marriage for us to become a unit through all things. From an atheistic worldview, why would I do that? Why would I do that? Tell me, why? From a Buddhistic worldview, why would I do that? Hinduism? Give me a... I, I, see, I see no real reason, okay? No convincing reason. To just say I should or I ought because it's good, those are all vague terms. You gotta point to what you mean by those words. What is good? What do you mean by ought? What is the thing that that language, that, that word tags, okay? Always use the univocal language. Good and evil is the thing that we have struggled with our whole lives. What is a good government? What is a bad government, right? Aristotle said all you know, men, men, all men are political by nature. As we, we gather in the polis and we ask the question, you know, how should we live, right? And then he says, suggests that political science, science, the knowledge of the city, is the highest, you know, science. Why? Because that's that's one where we live. And that's what he's writing about in the ethics. Okay? You should have already read through book three, if I'm correct. Okay? And you'll have another, I'll be making a quiz a day for each thing now. Or I might just put them together as a um, midterm depending on what you guys think. What do you think? Midterm, big test, or uh, midterm, big test, or just a bunch of small tests? You're gonna have to have something called a midterm. It's on the syllabus, but uh, I'll let you, let you stew about it. Maybe in the middle of this you go, I've thought about it. You just shout it out, okay? All right, moving from uh, Aristotle, uh, you know, the Christian world had emerged, Jesus, was born, all right? The Jews, prior to Jesus' uh, birth, were ex expecting a Messiah. The word Messiah in Hebrew means anointed one. In Greek, they call it Christos or Christ. Same word, Greek, Christ, Jewish Messiah mean anointed one, all right? What were they waiting for? You know, why were they waiting for this thing called the Anointed One? Well, uh, this is during the intertestamental period. It's spoken about, written about in First and Second Maccabees, or Antiochus. Uh, the the Greeks had taken over, and they they had um, started asserting their authority in the region. And you would have to worship the emperor. You'd have to create sacrifices towards their gods to show allegiance to the empire and the jews are monotheistic they believe in one god exclusively we're not going to worship no other gods before us right you've heard of that one you know part of the ten commandments otherwise known as the decalogue and they said well you know says so uh they realized that some of these people aren't sacrificing they sent people in to make sure that they do okay and the Maccabees, there was a revolt over this, and where you had Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, right? And his father uh, and brothers, they, they started a revolt, and it was by and large, it was successful. They got rid of the Greek influence in the area, and what ended up happening is they broke into different kingdoms because you had the northern and the southern, because uh, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, because they just couldn't get along, okay? And eventually Rome takes over, and Rome didn't 
come in like um, the Greeks did, Rome just kind of moved in and it was left unchallenged. But ultimately the same thing ends up happening is the Jews find themselves under the Roman yoke, by that means uh, under the Roman rule. And it's the same type of things that happened uh, under the Greeks. Hellenism emerged. Hellenism is the Greek culture uh, that influenced the, the Jewish people's area and they didn't like that because with, with the Greeks and uh, Romans came stuff like uh, new gods, new temples to new gods, to new religions in their area, they're monotheistic. It also brought in um, the, the temples, which brought in temple prostitutes, where to go uh, give your, you know, you'd go in, you'd offer your sacrifice, you'd have sex with a uh, temple prostitute, and that was your form of worship. You can see how these young Jewish boys uh, were probably being tempted into that. You also had uh, Jewish people being ashamed of being circumcised, so the Jews would try to hide, uh, the men would try to hide the fact that they were circumcised. And uh, that, keep in mind, that's a covenant that um, was made between the Jews and God, this uh, circumcision. And, and then you had uh, lots of stuff going on in theaters, like the promiscuity, uh, the eating of, uh, the breaking of, of dietary laws and the like. And so the Jews were not very happy with this. And so they were looking for somebody who would be kind of like the Maccabees in that they would lead them out from under the Roman yoke, okay? And so you had the, this party of Jews called the Zealots raise up. There are four parties of Jews. You had the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, which were like monks, okay? And then you had the zealots, those who wanted to overthrow the government and restore uh, the Jews back to power. Jesus was born into this. And so this idea that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, they would have expected what? Somebody who's going to lead them out from under the Roman yoke. Not a dying and rising Messiah, not one who's going to not establish his kingdom on earth, but establish it in heaven right your will be done on earth as it is in heaven okay and so jesus comes and he is uh this answer but then of course he uh, is rejected by the leadership of the church many of the jews many of the early church was jewish um we could talk about we will talk about christian theology and you should already know this quite a bit but during this time of course in you know, we're talking in Rome, which is influenced by the Greeks. Uh, so you have uh, Greek thought, Christian thought, all right? And you have uh, Jewish thought, Christian thought, and the Greeks. And so you have a lot of different ideas of what good and evil is. Do they jive? Do they go together? What does Jerusalem have to do with Athens, Tertullian would have asked and did ask. Should you reject all things that have to do with Plato? Or do you test all things, as Scripture says, and hold fast to that which is good? The answer is in what I just said. So if it is true, you hold on to it. If it's false, you get rid of it, of course. Mathematics isn't taught in the Bible. Doesn't mean it's false. Okay? Well, so there was a guy named Augustine now, I'm going to flash forward after Christ, death, burial, resurrection, ascension. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to flash even past the Acts of the Apostles, the spreading of the gospel. And I'm going to let you know that uh, for the first four centuries, Christianity was illegal. Okay? Until the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity legal. Constantine did that. Up until that point, Christians were burned at the stake, fed to the lions and beasts in, in the, in, uh, you know, and basically their gladiatorial events and, you know, your know, opening act would feed the Christians to the beasts and then let's have some good old fashioned fight to the deaths, right? Well, um, Christians would often, um, you know, the, they met in catacombs, 
that which were underground uh, cemeteries. They uh, had secret th symbols like the fish, right? Scratch a symbol, one side of the fish in the ground. Guy would scratch another side with his foot. You go, okay, he's a Christian brother. I can talk, right? The original church was mostly women because most of the uh, uh, women were found and raised by the Christian church. They were abandoned to be put to death because men uh, and women generally wanted boy children to carry on names, to do farm work. They were seen as an asset, not a liability. So if you had a female, you, you, could, you, you were less likely to want to feed her, so you'd take her and you'd leave her on the dump, and you let her die, that's infanticide. They, if you thought you were gonna have a girl, uh, you might have an abortion. Yes, abortions did exist back then. The church spoke out against both of these practices vehemently in, um, in the Didache. So moving forward, uh, it's still illegal. And then we get around 354, this guy named uh, uh, Aurelius um, Augustine, who's born. Now we're going to be reading Augustine's Confessions, okay? And he's born in the northernmost part of Africa, and uh, it's in Pagast, uh, it's in Algeria, and um, that's about all we need to know about that. He was 75 when he died. Considered the most important Latin father of the Christian church and suggesting that he's perhaps most significant uh, and an influential theologian since Paul the Apostle. Okay, uh, he wrote a lot, and if you read some of his writings, like on the Donatists and stuff like that, uh, it's interesting. He is less than politically correct. He tells them what he thinks of them, and he is not worried about what they think of him. All right? What was his concern? His concern was the truth. Now, Augustine himself was a perfect human being. He never sinned ever, not once in his life. And if I ever tell you that about anybody other than Jesus, the first thing you should say is BS. It's not true. Okay. Augustine was not a saint to begin with. Augustine, when he was raised, uh, he was a spoiled child, so to speak. He was being taught rhetoric. Now, the way things worked back then is if you were to go to school, you would... Uh, Basically, there were different schools of thought, but I mean, you, you would learn certain things. And in his case, he would learn rhetoric. Now, rhetoric is the art of convincing people. Now, people used it in politics and in law and the like. His goal was to become a professor of rhetoric, a teacher of rhetoric, and they would make their money you know, you go learn, you teach, and you get students. And it would, if we had school like that nowadays, I think I'd do pretty well because, you know, rather than have to get hired by a school, you know, instead you just go out and get students, right? And then I'd, let's say if I got five students a semester, charge each $3,000 a class, right? It's not a lot of money. All right, let's double that. Okay, 10, so it's about $30,000 a semester, do three semesters, you know, with summer and all that. I get 90,000 a year to teach, what, 30 students, is it? Not bad. Eh, but darn it, I'd have to have library stuff. And all that. Whatever, maybe we could do it. Well, anyway. So anyway, that was what his uh, thing was. And uh, all, the t all the while, he was a really wild youth, uh, he had, uh, a concubine, or he had an illegitimate child. Uh, he was a partier. He, you know, spent his uh, parents' money, and they didn't have a whole lot of it to spend. So uh, there comes a time where they run out of this. Um, he's he's learning Plato. He's learning Aristotle. He takes on certain. Uh, religious views that we'll discuss shortly. 
Uh, he has a major, his mom, Monica, is a Christian. Okay, the father is not yet. Yet. Father has no use for that. Um, he doesn't have any reason to be a Christian at this point. He's too busy having, uh, you know, fun. Uh, his father's mom's name is Monica. His father's name is Patricius. Um, let me see. I want to make sure I'm doing this correctly. I want to go in order. Deodontus is his son. We won't really talk much about him because we don't really uh, go on to talk much about him later. Um, well, anyway, one of his biggest issues he has is with the problem of evil. What we were talking about, where I led you. So all my pre-jumping into this ramblings led you somewhere. Why is there evil in the world? And why can nothing be done about it? Should nothing be done about it, right? Well, I mean, he had a problem there. You know, he got into a form of uh, Gnosticism, okay? And he was, you know, believing that, you know, there's this eternal battle between good and evil. And they just, uh, the battle between Orzmud and, I forget the other guy, uh, God's name, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get them both for you. It's not as important right now, but they're constantly battling and there's no, no neither one are ever going to win on this one, okay? And the, uh, it's called Manichae, uh, Manichaeanism, okay? And it's from the teachings of Manny. So, Manichaeanism, which you'll probably spell incorrectly, and I'm not going to spell it for you now. I'll put it up on, on the board later. So I don't embarrass myself by spelling it because it's kind of crazy <laughs> spelling it. Uh, you know. Um, it, uh, it had this helped him a bit. It kind of gave an answer to what good and evil was. But as Augustine started reading more Aristotle and more Plato, what do you do when you start reading philosophers? You start questioning, questioning what they're teaching you, right? And they start pulling the thread. Okay? And when you start pulling the thread, the sweater starts to fall, fall apart. And so he started questioning his teachers of Manichaeanism. And like, I don't know, man. I don't know. Just wait till this guy gets here. And, you know, once the, this you know, guy who was supposed to be this great teacher of Manichaeanism shows up, he found out this guy didn't know Jack. And he's like, all right, well, I'm done. But he had taken on Neoplatonism and uh, Aristotelianism and all this stuff. Now, Neoplatonism is a little different than Platonism. Neoplatonism takes on the view uh, that there's this... We'll call it a thing for now, called the One, okay? And the One is that thing from which all other things come. Okay, now, by the way, that that's, sounds like God, that thing from which all other things come, all right? And anything that is uh, the result of this is obviously less than that which it comes from. Makes sense? Now, I want you to imagine, if any of you can, um, if you've ever watched enough television or whatnot, you've ever seen these fancy you know, these really fancy balls and stuff where they have these stacks, like a little pyramid of wine glasses, of champagne glasses, and where they take the champagne bottle and open it and they pour it on the very top champagne glass and out from over, it overflows and then it fills up all the other champagne glasses as they pour into that top one, right? 
That's kind of like how reality is uh, dispensed from the one. It overflows, so to speak, right? And so the one is that thing from which all other things flow. And this idea that uh, the evil is a privation of the good. Okay, now, now Augustine can go with that. Now, Augustine is still searching for religious truth and all this stuff after he gives up Manichaeanism, and he stumbles upon the, the, the preachings of a guy named Ambrose, A-M-B-R-O-S-E. That I can spell without writing it out. And Ambrose, uh, he really enjoys his uh, style of preaching. Eventually, uh, you know, Augustine is eventually going, going to uh, become a Christian. And one of the things, you know, his thing is, he says this thing, give me, um, he says, give me something in chastity, but not yet. I forget what it is. You know, uh, the idea that he wanted to be holy and chaste but he was still tempted to live in the flesh, right? And he really spoke uh, pretty eloquently as a, as a young man who struggled with the idea of what it means to become a Christian. And so when he finally did decide he was going to become a Christian, he really went head, headlong into it, and he ended up becoming a bishop eventually, and a prolific uh, writer in, of uh, Christian thought. Now, the, the book we're going to read from him is called The Confessions, and this is pretty much his conversion story. And it starts off with saying, The heart is restless until it rests in thee. The heart is restless until it rests in thee. Now, let's, let's go back to Aristotle and talk about the idea that we're pursuing happiness, this idea that we pursue that thing for which no, you know, uh, we want for itself and nothing else more, right? And ask yourself if you are restless and for what are you restless? I train for a lot of things. Um, I remember when I was working towards my PhD, uh, I had a picture of the regalia I would get to wear, the, the robes. I always thought the Baylor robes were really cool, green and gold, really cool looking. And I had a picture, that's what I got to earn. And then, you know, uh, I also had the idea of my dissertation and a big old diploma on the wall. Is that happiness? Well, I got it. I'm really thankful for those things. I never actually bought the regalia. Um, no, it wasn't it. Once that's that's already been a long time past, okay. Should I just hang it up? I, I already, you know, life has been lived, it's done, you know, nothing good is nothing else. Now, I train for jujitsu tournaments. I'm coming up, I've got gold medals hanging on my wall. Does that mean I'm, I'm it? Does that it? No, there's always another guy, right? And I could always be beat by somebody else, right? So, it doesn't satisfy. My heart is still restless. Where shall we place our heart so that our heart will no longer be restless? And Augustine would say, our heart is restless until it rests in thee. And thus starts his story about how he brought his heart to the Lord. Finally, his dad did come to the Lord and did die, but thankfully he came. So the question at the end of the day, you know, part of it was, you know, how does, how does the Christian God answer, give answer to evil? Why ought we do one thing rather than ought not do another? Why ought we live one life rather than another, right? Because God is good, right? And if God is good and our heart is restless till it rests in thee, and we want to be like God, God-like, Christian-like, Christians, right? Then to have that, where our heart is no longer restless, that we've reached that highest good, then we ought to. Okay? It is all gauged upon the, the objective notion of the good, that good actually exists. 
that there's an objective good, that this objective good, by the way, uh, Augustine did not give up his Platonism. That's going to be abundantly clear in his writings. So he used Plato as his philosopher in discussing the truths, the Christian truths, okay? And that's why philosophy, one, is important to us, because we use it to expound and test the truths of Christianity. Because if Christianity is not true, then we ought not to follow it, correct? If you're not a Christian, it's because you don't believe that the propositions contained in Christianity are true. If you are a Christian, it is because you believe that the propositions contained in Christianity are true. See, you're making philosophical assumptions, or assertions, I should say. The philosopher, Augustine, becomes a Christian because he believes the propositions contained in it are, in fact, true. And he's going to make use of Plato and all his philosophical training to defend these notions. And he's going to use it to also develop, to develop Christian thought. He's going to write two major works, several major works, but two that we're going to talk about. One, the Confessions, and two, the City of God. First is going to be Confessions, which I've just briefly talked about, and I want you to start reading that. All right? If you read the introduction to it, you'll get a more complete description of this lecture. Okay? Some more dates, more names, discussion of his son, discussion of his concubine, discussion of his um, time in, you know, Manichaeanism, stuff like that. Discussion of what Manichaeanism is, and maybe perhaps even discussion of Plotinus, Plotinus being the leader of uh, Neoplatonism. What does Neo mean? New, New Platonism, okay? So it's not Plato for Plato. All right, any questions? I know we're out of time. I literally just started and we're out of time. Question? Oh, so do we ever carry around the definition of Manichaeanism? He has a religious belief about good and evil, that where you had two opposing um, ideas of what good and evil, that you had two gods that opposed each other, and one was good, one was evil, and they, um, I, I forgot the other name, one was called Orzmud, and I think the other one, I, if I could remember, I could sure it's like Aharamid or something like that, Hafriman or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's just a religious belief that he took on that gave him a, a decent answer or an acceptable one at the time of what good and evil was. Uh, it was a form of Gnosticism, just to let you know. There are a lot of Gnostic beliefs out there rejected by the Christian church. Keep in mind, Christianity is still illegal at this point. Right. There are no other questions. I will see you on Wednesday if you so choose. If not, keep in mind, I'm going to start you know, shotgunning some quizzes out there to catch you up on, on, on your work, all right? Um, for the quizzes that you're sending out, will we have time to watch the video again? Yeah, use it. Okay, awesome. It's open video, why not? Because uh, I'm not even going to lie, I'd have to watch your uh, lecture eight video again before I even look at <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know that. But it's there, so don't worry about it. You are not going on.